Good, good morning almost. No, it's good afternoon. Thank you very much to everybody who's uh, joined uh, this talk. I'll start again if you were already here. This uh, talk is on um, uh, privacy and why respecting your customers' privacy makes good ethical sense and good business sense. Um, it's going to be split really into, into two parts. The first part really is why this is important, why respecting your customers' privacy is important, why is it, it's a particularly relevant um, topic today, and I think it's becoming very, very relevant, which I'll come on to. And the second part is going to be more about, uh, both from a personal perspective and a business perspective, what the alternatives are. So what the alternatives are, for example, for Google Analytics. Um, uh, and uh, things and uh, email marketing uh, and it's, it's both from a personal and a business perspective and then the final part really is why I think it makes really good business sense to respect your customers um, privacy and some of it might be a little bit of counterintuitive because we're so used to um, uh, having having reams and reams of data that's, that's the wonders of the internet and being able to use them to really get to know our customers but I'm actually going to argue that uh, that isn't necessarily the case. So I'm now going to um, share my presentation, uh, which we'll go on to now. I'm going to share the screen. So first off, a caveat. Um, sorry. Sorry for the technical issues, <laughs> we'll get there soon. So firstly, a caveat. Um, as I said, this is a bit counterintuitive in the sense that uh, normally we'd expect we want to know as much about our customers as possible, we want to know as much data as possible. And for some businesses, this is very true. Uh, you do want to know, uh, you need to know, you know, for example, if um, your business relies on Facebook ad campaigns, then a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, may not be entirely relevant to you. But what I do hope is that by becoming more aware of the issues facing um, uh, us with privacy constraints, that maybe by raising awareness and thinking about these things, then um, we can kind of start changing our behavior and start changing our business approach to the way we treat our customers. So I acknowledge that some of this, hopefully some of this will be very, very relevant to you and some things that you can kind of think about how you can change your business practices and others just won't be relevant, won't be achievable because it impacts your business too much. And at the end of the day, your business needs to be viable. And if it relies on lots and lots of data, if you're a, uh, you know, if you're a big, big business, I would say if you're a big, big business who doesn't know their customers very well, then you're gonna need your data. My argument would be though that a lot of businesses who um, that we know in and around Bath, who are quite small businesses, probably know your customers well enough not to need to rely on all this data. So why is this important? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's becoming more and more important at the moment, you know, with various things that have been going on, what with uh, political campaigns like Trump and Brexit, where there are accusations um, against people like Facebook and YouTube, um, you know, taking people down certain alleys and um, spreading disinformation. But more importantly, both the EU and the US Congress, which is the US Parliament, are both bringing antitrust cases against the big tech companies. So after 15, 20 years of um, these big tech companies, and I'm talking here, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, having building up these big big monopolies and building up these massive data stores the governments are now challenging this both the eu and congress are now challenging this so i think that's why it's important i also think it's important from from our business perspective you know we live in a a, a democracy democracy is important uh, people need to know that they're not being tracked you know at the moment when you're online every move you make is being tracked every website you look at is being tracked every behavior you, you um, do every button you get clicked it can be tracked and so they're building up these reams and reams of data on, on you and um it's not necessary in my opinion <laughs> so just as an example um 
it's not just in terms of that, but it's also in terms of our behaviour. So as Cal Newport said in his book, Digital Minimism, the, they or we joined Facebook to stay in touch with friends across the country and then ended up unable to maintain an uninterrupted conversation with the friends sitting across the table. So this is important in the sense that our addiction to, um, which has been fueled by people like Facebook and Google, our addiction to mobile phones and scrolling timelines and things like that, um, it's having an impact on our personal relationships. You know, how often do you go out for a meal with friends and the phone comes out to try and remember the name of an actor in a film or something like that? You know, we're getting too, it's becoming too much of a habit to pick up the phone. And they say, well, what's that got to do with privacy? Well, I'll come on to it, but it's to do with addiction and the fact that Facebook and Google and people like that are encouraging you to have a moderate addiction so they can sell advertising back at you. Another quote that I just wanted to share with you uh, is by John Norton, and he is uh, a columnist uh, who writes a weekly article in The Observer about tech. And um, uh, more and more of his articles recently have been on privacy and the march of big tech and the monopolies that they're creating. And a recent quote from him, having plundered the natural world, capitalism has now turned to extracting and exploiting what's in our heads. You know, climate, we all understand that climate change is, is a big, big issue. And uh, to me, privacy is, is a big, big issue as well, but in a different way, in a mental way. And um, really, it does come down to this kind of, these four words to me. So Facebook and Google in particular rely on encouraging people um, to spend as long as they can on their social media feeds or their search. They want your attention because the more attention they get, the more data they get, uh, and the more they can sell advertising back to you. And the way how they do this attention, how do they encourage it? Well, it's through addiction. Now that to you might seem like quite a strong word, but it's, we're not talking about strong addiction. We're not talking about crack addiction, for example. You know, if you can't look at Facebook, I'm not saying that you're going to go and hold up a corner store to get some money so you can buy crack. That's not what um, where Facebook is at. Um, but it is a moderate form of addiction, and it's and it's uh, you know you you know that if you're waiting for a train or waiting for a friend to arrive at a cafe, the likelihood is you're going to get your mobile phone out and you're going to look at Instagram or Facebook and you're going to mindlessly scroll through it. And the reason you're doing that is because. Facebook have very, very cleverly created this um, area where it encourages you to look, encourage you to scroll. And they're not doing that because um, for any kind of altruistic reasons. Okay, obviously we enjoy it and we do get benefits out of it. You know, we keep in touch with friends and that's really good. And there are good things about all these things. But I think we need to just be careful and aware of the fact that it is encouraging our addiction. And there are a couple of ways they do it. One is through outrage we know we can see through the brexit debates and the trump debates and black lives matter and all these other um you know, jk rowling uh trans debates you know all these debates uh, are kind of very black and white whereas we all know that there can be more nuance to it if you're having a face-to-face -face conversation a lot more nuance around debates but on social media it becomes very black and white you know you're either right or you're wrong and what it does, it encourages this kind of filter bubble of people. I, I know, you know, during the Brexit debate, for example, the people I was conversing with all agreed with me. So how am I going to change my views and my opinions if I haven't got, or I understand what the other side are thinking unless I can see that. And the problem is social media in particular is doing um, a very uh, manipulative thing about spreading outrage. Um, it's not to say everything, of course, in social media is bad, it isn't. I'm not saying that. And um, uh, I read a great quote recently about with social media. You know, you don't have to see all the nasty stuff. You can create your own little garden of nice things. And I think certainly saying, for example, I find that in Twitter and Facebook, you just follow the people you like that don't cause this outrage or whatever, and it works quite well. So, um, there's that, so the outrage is kind of fueling addiction, but also this fear of missing out. You know, we, um, when we're scrolling through Facebook, when we're posting things on Instagram, 
you know, we love getting that dopamine hit when somebody likes. And the way their algorithms work is that they tend to kind of drip feed you those little likes. And, um, uh, and it's that kind of um, anticipation that just creates a little bit more addiction. So that's, um, that's kind of the background. And what's that got to do with privacy? Well, as I said earlier, the more attention, the more time your Googles and your Facebooks keep on you, the more data they collect and the more they can send it back to you. So this is just one example. This is uh, from a Medium article I read recently by Rob Sturgeon Storius. And um, he did a little experiment. He got a little uh, app called Jumbo and it tells you how often you get tracked. And uh, he reckons, he did this over a week and he multiplied it by 52 weeks. He reckons every year on his smartphone only, he would get tracked two and a quarter million times. Now he's an app developer, so admittedly he probably is on his smartphone a little bit more. And one of the apps is, is to do with crash, crash, it's called Crashalytics by Google. And it basically gives him some really, really useful feedback on when an app crashes, why it's happened. So it's not to say that every tracking is bad, but it just gives you an idea of how much you are being tracked. And to think most of it is Google, 29% being Google Analytics, 7% uh, is Amazon, 6% Facebook, but Google absolutely dominate the tracking. A lot of it is through Google Analytics. It's also through um, AdSense as well, so all the AdWords and things like that. And the, the sad thing is, you know, we're being tracked all the time. We are being the product, but this wasn't the original plan. You know, originally, um, Steve Jobs stood up in 2007 saying the iPhone was the best iPod we've ever made. So in other words, the initial intention wasn't that the iPhone would become or a smartphone, in fact, would become this ubiquitous um, device that we would carry around with us every time that we would spend three hours a day looking at goodness knows what. Not really sure what we're looking at, we're just looking at because we've got nothing else to do. The original idea, and if you, if you go back to 2007, then it was the best iPod we've ever made. That's what it was there for, that's what was amazing about it. It was pre-apps, for example. And when Facebook was launched, it was basically a novelty, this sort of virtual freshman's directory. The whole point around Facebook initially was that it was a place where people, uh, people at, uh, at university or equivalent could just keep in touch with the people that they knew at university. And it's become this big um, monopoly. It's, it's kind of morphed into some other business. And Google, well, they just wanted to get you off their search page as soon as possible. And that was an actual, uh, that's based on an actual quote from Larry Page, one of the co-founders back in 2004, that was their aim. It was to get people, you know, they, they would deliver your search results as quickly as possible and be off on uh, whichever website answered your query. Now, it's estimated in some searches, Google take 40% of the front page. So Google generated content, be that in advertising, Google Maps, Google Business, Google Answers, take up 40% of page one. So, you know, th this, this is the, the issue we're facing. So I touched upon earlier the fact that um, US Congress and the EU are both looking at these issues. And this is why I think privacy has become such an important topic because there is change afoot. I think all big tech companies who've built up these monopolies over the last 10 to 15 years are gonna be facing the music. And that's not to say it's gonna happen tomorrow, but it's gonna happen over the next few years. And I think this is a challenge that we need to be aware of and as businesses and as individuals, we need to be ready for and to embrace as well. So this quote is from a 449 page report presented by the House Judiciary Committee. And it said, companies that once for scrappy underdog startups that challenge the status quo have become the kinds of monopolies we last saw in the era of oil barons and railroad tycoons. So a hundred years ago, the US faced a very, very similar issue with um, uh, uh, Standard Electric and uh, the I can't remember, there was a company who built railroads basically everywhere in the US whose name I can't recall, and they created this monopoly. And it took a bit of time, but the government caught up with it and ended up breaking up those monopolies and uh, increasing competition. 
and the same thing is happening with the internet at the moment you know i think and, and you see it time and time again you know these new technologies come forward it might be oil it might be railroad it might be tobacco or it might be the internet and it changes people's behavior over a couple of decades and basically the government then suddenly realized oh this is changing people's behavior and these startup companies have become big monopolies because they're mining data and in this instance mining so much data that we have to do something and regulation is coming you know similarly in the 1990s microsoft were challenged with pre-installing internet explorer and their operating system on almost every computer ever developed the same is happening with big tech what's more two days ago on tuesday uh the um Department of Justice in the United States, and this is a Republican Department of Justice for now, maybe won't be in there next month, um, bought a lawsuit against Google. And this was about monopoly. This was basically saying they're using, they're abusing their monopoly position by putting their search engine by default. They, they pay billions of pounds to Apple to have their, de their search engine default on Safari. They have it as default on Android, and it's very, very difficult to change it. And of course, by having that monopoly of search, it means that they're collecting data and it means their ads are being served up on the search results as well. So the Department of Justice on Tuesday has brought a lawsuit against Google on that. So it's happening, it's changing. And if you just look at this, this is Google. These are all the products they have. They've got Google Search and Google Ads, they've got Google Maps, they've got Gmail. Gmail, if you're using Gmail, they are, they can, they, they're using software to look through your inbox to advertise back at you. I know you're probably, you're not personally identifiable. You know, they would argue you're not. It's all done on IP address and that's true. It is all done on IP address. Um, and they don't know that when I'm doing Google search, they don't know necessarily that it's Andrew Evelyn, but if I'm logged in, they can easily find that out if they need to. So they've got Gmail, they've got Google Home, Google Analytics, which is two thirds of every of all the websites in the world, you know that's a free product. And you know why it's free? Because they're getting so much wonderful, wonderful data about your website. They know everything about your website. And yes, Google Analytics is a business. And as a web designer, which I am, I've got Google Analytics on many of my clients' websites, and they rely on it for data. And it is very, very useful data. But as I will come on to, there are alternatives. We don't necessarily need to use this. And if we want to respect our customers, then we can move elsewhere. YouTube's another one, uh, which obviously dominates the video viewing sphere and also has a reputation of, you know, ad advertisers have been boycotting YouTube recently because they're finding their adverts were being used alongside very, very dodgy um, videos. So, you know, advertisers are beginning to think about this, about how, um, how these big companies can control content. Another thing about Google is, you know, they've built this monopoly up from search. And what they do is, you know, things like Google Home, what they're learning from there is the way you speak to um, your, um, your speaker, your smart speaker, and that helps with Google Translate because they're getting nuances of your voice. They're using Google Photos to uh, work out how to recognize people's faces, you know, face recognition. Now, in itself, this is marvelous. You know, this technology is great stuff. You know, in some ways, it really, really does help us. And this isn't about making, you know, making Google disappear off the face of the earth. For one, that's unrealistic. And two, it's not necessarily a good thing. And you know, Google Search has been an amazing benefit to many people me included, you know, it's a great way for finding a way around the internet. But to my mind, these people are going too far. They're mining our data, they're invading our privacy too much, and we need to take a step back from that. Facebook, similarly, they, they, they've got a monopoly, and um, as, as I said earlier, 99%, they're an advertising company, essentially 99% of their revenue comes from advertising, privacy invader and disinformation spreader. You know, recent news item, uh, during the um, Black Lives Matters campaigns. If you remember back in the summer, loads and loads of businesses uh, decided to boycott uh, Facebook advertising. We're talking big companies like Hoover, Ford, Starbucks, um, Patagonia. Um, um, it's, uh, uh, the campaign was Stop Hate for Profit. 
And I was actually hoping this is going to be big, this is going to be good, this should help, this should kind of force Facebook to rethink their whole business model. Unfortunately, it hasn't because I think businesses have become a little self-interested and maybe started advertising again. But the fact is, there's this, uh, you know, Facebook, there's this big debate over, are Facebook just hosts of content? In other words, they don't have to go in and edit or censor that content, or, or are they the publishers? And, you know, many, many people would say that Facebook has to have some responsibility over what is published on that platform. And that Stop Hate for Profit campaign was campaigning for that, basically saying, you know, Facebook, you need to be careful about the kind of disinformation you're spreading. Um, and the reason they're doing it is because they want to kind of, you know, outrage works, outrage gets eyeballs. You know, we've seen it back in the days of the press when the tabloids used to have these weird and wonderful headlines like Freddie Starr ate my hamster or um, you know gotcha when you know, these awful headlines but the, uh, during the Falklands War gotcha which was a terrible headline but um, uh, you know that that's what encourages people to buy papers buy newspapers so it's not exactly a new thing it's always been going on but it's going on in a way that's um, that's kind of more invasive of your privacy now you know you could pick up a newspaper you could put it down now with the way algorithms work, um, there's something a little bit darker going on, I would say. So that's Facebook. They, they dominate WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram is dominant. And I think from a business perspective, I think we'd all admit it'd be very difficult for most businesses to drop both Facebook and Instagram. I certainly would find that difficult. And then from a personal perspective, WhatsApp, what can replace WhatsApp? Well, there are... I suppose what I would say with this is there are different ways to behave using these, but if you wanted to go the whole way, then there are alternatives and you could drop using them. So just for um, uh, uh, to be complete, the other two big tech companies that are being um, investigated by both the EU and um, the House Judiciary are Amazon, because they've got a monopoly, they're basically um, using, uh, not, not in the, they're not as bad in terms of invading personal privacy as Facebook and Google, but they are um, selling third party suppliers, the accusation against them is selling third party goods and using the data to find out what works, what doesn't, and replace them with their own products. And Apple are being accused of being a monopoly. This essentially is through the App Store, the fact that if you download an app on iPhone, you have to go through the App Store um, and Apple will charge the app developer 30% for the privilege. Uh, and also Apple Pay is um, locking out other competitors. So that's the accusation against them. But I would caveat that Apple actually are a privacy protector that out of the, the four, they're probably doing the most in terms of protecting our privacy and giving us options. And of course, the reason for that is because they make a load of money selling hardware to us. So they don't need to mine our data. They don't need to use our data to sell that back to us for adverts. Uh, and actually, you, know, you can go into Safari and you can change your web browser, your search um, uh, to DuckDuckGo. You can replace Google quite easily. And what's more, in iOS 14, which has um, just been launched, there are new features coming, which I'll come on to, which actually will help protect your privacy. Also with Apple with Safari, you can already block pop-ups and you can already block cross-tracking as well very quite easily. But you still have to go into their settings to do it, but it's there. So that sums it up, you know, if you aren't paying for the product, you are the product. And this is particularly true in terms of Facebook and Google. Your customers are being, and you are being mined for data because it's a free product. And really, if you boil it all down to one thing, it's really all about advertising. You know, there are all sorts of um, things contributing to this, you know, but it's about advertising. The reason why Facebook and Google in particular want to um, mine all your data, it's because they want to advertise it back to you. That's where their revenue is. And somebody called Shoshana Zuboff wrote a book and coined a phrase called surveillance capitalism. And this is um, uh, really, this is all about this whole book. I haven't read the book, it's a long book and um, you know, my brain cells don't have enough capacity for it necessarily. But I probably, I, I, you know, it's something that will be on my reading list. Um, but it is all about this capitalism is about 
tracking your every move on the internet and using that data and using their algorithms to um, maximize their revenue from you. Just to show you advertising companies as a percentage of turnover. So Facebook, 99%. Google, 80% of their revenue comes from advertising. And for Amazon, it's 40 billion is estimated in 2023. So I suppose what we need to do is think a bit differently about your Facebooks and Googles. Not that they're search engines or they're social media platforms, but they're actually advertising companies. That's what they're there for. You know, ever since they were quoted on the stock exchange, they need to maximize their revenue and they're doing it through advertising. And the only way they're doing that is because of data. And this by Paul Jarvis. He wrote, um, Paul Jarvis is a guy who wrote a really good book called The Company of One, which I've read over the summer during lockdown. It's all about how a company of one can actually make a very, very good business. You don't need to become a big company. Not quite relevant to this. But the other thing is he's set up a new product or, or he's part of a new product called Fathom Analytics, which I'll talk about more as a really good alternative to Google Analytics. And he summed this up really nicely, I think. If companies weren't allowed to collect our personal data in the first place, nor use it to target us with ads, it would instantly fix privacy concerns, political manipulation, and disinformation in ads. Now, why does he say that? Well, because the only reason your Googles and your Facebooks are tracking your every move, are wanting to keep your attention through um, political outrage, and disinformation is because they want as much data about you as possible. They, they want that data to re-manipulate so they can advertise back to you. But they also want your eyeballs, they want your time, they want you to spend as much time as possible on their Facebook or Instagrams because that's where they get their revenue. That's why they can say to businesses, we've got these eyeballs, you can break a great business by getting in front of them and um, sell back to them and that's where they make their money. So you know, all this advertising is tracking your IP address. It's tracking your individual behavior um, around the internet. And you, you know, that's not how adverts started out. They, it's only really um, about 10, 12 years ago that Google started collecting your, your individual IP address. And for those of you who don't know what an IP address is, it's the individual code number that is attached to each device you have. So the iPad that I'm doing this on has an IP address. My phone has a different one. But because they're all linked into my Google account, then they know it's the same person as me. So there are alternatives. Excuse me, plug of water. So there are alternatives to this. Um, so the next kind of bit, uh, hopefully that first bit is just kind of giving you a bit of background as to why I think there's an issue with privacy. And this is just going to go through what alternatives there are. The first thing I'm going to talk about is cookies. So cookies are little bits, little bits of code, uh, are very lightweight bits of code that you wouldn't notice that are on pr pretty much every web page you visit, but every single web page they visit, you visit. And some of them are there to stop um, naughty things happening, um, people in, in, impersonating you. Some of them there are really, really useful. For example, if you're an online store, Cookies are really useful because uh, it helps people fill in your shopping basket and use your name and your address and things like that. So they're certainly not all bad. But also, if you've got Google Analytics on uh, a website and that has cookies, as does Facebook Pixels, and as do lots of other advertising cookies. And the thing is, if you give permission to cookie, say to Google, or um, or if you have a plugin like Discus or an ad this social media share they all add more and more cookies. Now this doesn't necessarily slow your web page down because the fact is that code is really small, but what it does do is it gets information about your behavior, what you're visiting on the website, which buttons you're clicking on, how long you're staying on there, and what adverts you're interested in, what products you're interested in. This cookies are what, so when you're, if you look at a website for a bag you really like, and then you go on to a, another website and you find an advert for a bag coming back to you. That was a cookie that told the advertising company that this person's interested in looking at bags. And this really is the kind of the technology behind privacy. And cookies know, um, cookie, cookies, basically, if you remember GDPR, 
and all those annoying cookie banners that came about, where GDPR was all about privacy, it was all about data protection. And cookie banners came in as part of that to say, you as an individual need to give permission to each website as to whether you want your um, behavior online to be tracked. Now, the idea was this should be really easy. And most of us, unfortunately, myself included, are really lazy and just go, yes, because it gets so boring and dull to say no and then have to click through the preferences and disable any advertising tracking cookies. I know I've tried. It's really it's very time consuming. And uh, actually, in my opinion, it goes against GDPR anyway, because those cookie banners should, by default, have those tracking things turned off. And you should say, yeah, I don't mind them on but they don't, it's not that way around. So I have actually disabled cookies completely from my brighter side websites. Uh, and uh, something called, uh, and, and really called black lights, which will show you whether you have two, there's a couple of things actually. But my argument with does your website really need to annoy, annoy your visitors? Do you really need a cookie banner? Um, and I'll come on to uh, say why you might not need to. But if you want to go on to um, the markup, which is a, a website which talks all about privacy and monopolies and does long form articles on this, really interesting if you use that kind of thing, have just launched this um, tool called Blacklight. And what it will do is if you put your domain into it, it'll tell you if there are any um, tracking cookies on there, who's peeking over your shoulder, as they say. And you'll see on the right hand side of this image on my website, brightside.co.uk, I don't have any. I don't have any Facebook pixels, I don't have any Google Analytics, I have no ad trackers. And you might think, well, what's a web design business not having any trackers on there? How can you run your business and not know who's visiting or how often they're visiting and what they're doing on there? Surely that means you're blind to what's happening. Well, not necessarily. I'll show you the alternatives in a minute. Another good website is cookieserve.com, which will also track your um, uh, trawl through your website and tell you what cookies you do have. And what that will do, if you put my website in brightersign.co.uk, it will say I have one cookie and it's called Crumb. And that's pretty essential because uh, that's what's called a necessary cookie. And that stops people um, hacking, um, uh, kind of man manipulating the website and, um, and uh, uh, duplicating me and pretending uh, that they are me. And actually GDPR, Basically, when you click on a cookie banner, what that is, is um, a GDPR is saying non-essential cookies. So Chrome is actually an essential cookie because it just um, it helps with the security of the internet. So that's the only cookie I have on my brightest side website. So if you look at both either of those websites, markup.org forward slash blacklight or cookieserve.com, you can just see how many cookies you've got. And if you go back to my earlier slide where, uh, um, there were two and a quarter million tracks on the smartphone. On average, you get two and a quarter million tracking devices or tracking apps on your act oh, sorry, tracking activities on your smartphone. What you can see on brightside.co.uk you would have zero. So, from a personal perspective, how do you remove cookies? Well, you can delete the ones you already have in your browser settings. You can use an ad blocker, uh, or you can use a virtual private network. Um, which will um, basically what that does will stop tracking happening um, at your Wi-Fi booster. So you're not actually on the public internet, you're actually somewhere private, or you can repeatedly click on cookie settings, which is damn annoying. I did a, a, a very unscientific Twitter poll a couple of months ago saying, uh, what do you think of cookie banners? Do you think they're good eggs or pesky little blighters? 100% of people came back and said pesky little blighters. So, there you go. I think getting rid of cookie settings, you know, from a, from a customer perspective, this is where it's ethically a good thing because you're not tracking your customer, your customer, your website visitors' behaviour. You're respecting that, but also from a business perspective, it's good because you're not annoying them with those cookie settings. So it makes it easier for them to browse around your website. So for me, this is a this is a great thing to do. So. If you, this is from a personal perspective, if you were conscious of privacy and you didn't want to be tracked, here are just a couple of things that you, or a couple of um, things you could do and a couple of alternatives to using Google Chrome, for example, or Microsoft Edge. 
First off, uh, there's Brave, which is a, uh, a privacy, and I have to thank uh, Sarah Thayer, a slow coach, um, a slow coach Sarah, for pointing in the direction of this. Brave, which is a, um, a, a, a open source web browser that blocks all tracking and has one of those things up at the top that says you're being tracked and, and what this is what we've blocked. Uh, Opera is another one. Both Opera and Brave ha have virtual private networks built in, so they're very, very secure in terms of preventing anybody tracking your behavior. And DuckDuckGo is another option. That's what I use, actually. And DuckDuckGo pre uh, have also come into alliance with Global Privacy Settings Company, which is that um, they don't have a logo, but that take control of your privacy image at the top is the header of their website. And what they, that will do is a brilliant little thing. As I understand it, if you um, install DuckDuckGo and make that your default browser, for example, on your iPhone, and you uh, tick the preference for um, global privacy settings, you no longer have to click cookie banners. How marvelous! Because what it does is it remembers your privacy settings and tell every website you visit, that's my privacy. So these are really good options if you want, as an individual, not as a business, this is, but as an individual, uh, you want to um, prevent people being tracked around the internet. And this is the biggie, isn't it? Uh, so, you know, all this privacy, this invasion of privacy and this uh, moderate addiction to social media all comes about because of ads. It's one of the alternatives. Uh -huh. Just as a little stat, it's estimated the number of times the average US citizen is exposed to digital ads every single day is between four and 10,000. I mean, I have to admit that seems ridiculously high. I don't get that it can be that high, but that's what I read. Um, but there again, there are lies, damned lies and statistics. But I think what it does do is it points to the fact that you get to see a lot of ads. So what can you do about ad blocking? Well, apparently 30% of people use ad blockers now. And the icon on the right is Adblock, which is a free software. You can get a paid version, but you can install that on your web browser, your computer, from your smartphone, and that will block ads, pop up ads. Uh, it's also estimated that with ads, there's quite a lot of fraud click farms. And also, 68% of people are not okay with their behavior being tracked for ads. So, you know, ads I know can be very, very beneficial to some businesses. And um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't advertise. But what I'm saying you should think about is maybe not using ads that are um, uh, uh, demographic related. You know, so Google Ads, when you go into Google Ads, you can, you can aim your ads at a certain age group, certain interest groups, where they live, um, you know, what gender they are, all that kind of thing. To me, that is you know, potentially invading people, what is invading people's individual privacy. But there is alternatives. You can, if you do and must use ads, then you could just use keywords. You know, that's all about intent. And keywords, you know, this is how Google Ads started off until they bought um, AdSense. Uh, they, they didn't have an ability to demographically target people to click on ads and to encourage them. They didn't have that ability to chase you around the internet. And if you look at a bag on one website, to look on every single website thereafter for the next five days where bags keep on getting advertised back at you. If you just do it on keywords, then you don't need to, it's not based on um, tracking IP addresses or anything like that. So that is a good alternative. If you do, your business survives because Google AdWords is extremely important to you. Just try keywords. You know, you can make something out of that. You can talk about, you know, we're not we're not invading your privacy. We're not tracking your individual behavior. We just use keywords. That to me is a kind of a marketing um, plus in itself. Um, if from an individual perspective, you want to check what information you have or, or Google and Facebook in particular have about you, if you follow those web addresses, you'll see, uh, you can find out what information they're recording on you. Email newsletters. Ha. So in a way, email newsletters are probably, in terms of an individual invasion of privacy, you could argue email newsletters are probably one of the biggest. <laughs> because as anyone knows who sends an email out, you can go into MailChimp and you can find out the name of the person who opened it, how many times they opened it, and what they clicked on. So um, 
this, you know, with MailChimp, you can disable that. So that is one option. If you don't want to invade people's privacy, turn it off, um, turn off that reporting. And the reason I think um, this, we are potentially going to see a change in this, I'm just going to take some more time. It's because of this new product. It's called Hey, and you may or may not have heard of it, but it was launched in the summer. And it's a new email platform called Hey. And it has many, many um, attributes. I've started using it, and, it's, uh, and there's a number of reasons why I use it. One of the reasons, which is particularly relevant to today's talk, is that um, it prevents spy pixels tracking you. So when you open an email newsletter in Hey, the person who sends it won't know whether you've opened it. Uh, and the way they do it, basically, email newsletters can track the recipient's behavior by the images that are downloaded on the email. So on there, they have a little bit of a spy pixel and they know because that image is downloaded on a remote server, they know it's been downloaded into your inbox and that's classified as an open. And they can track from that. What Hey does is download the image on their Hey servers before it arrives at your inbox. So you don't actually know whether me as an individual has opened it. And to me, that's great. I, I, you know, even though email marketing is one of my things, um, I, it does, I'm really conscious that it does invade people's privacy. And uh, Hey is the first company that has stopped, uh, it's preventing spy pixels, tra pixels tracking you. If I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would say Apple will bring that in on their Apple Mail within the next 12 months. You heard it here first. So as businesses, email marketing, and if uh, if you were good enough to have heard my talk on Monday about um, why email marketing is possibly the most e important marketing asset you own, then I think email it, it's such a key, key marketing thing. How are we going to get around this? How are we going to um, uh, manage our marketing if we can't track individual behavior? Well, Campaign Monitor, which is an email platform, wrote a really interesting blog post about it, which I have summarized here. And what they were writing about is how do you as email marketeers get, you know, uh, work out best practice when you don't know who's opened and when they've opened. Um, and there's a few things here. So Campaign Monitor argued, well, uh, what it does do, so, so one of the other things Hey does is it has a screener. So every time an email comes in for the first time from somebody, you can say yes or no within your Hey inbox. So it's really much easier than subscribing. You just say, no, I don't want to see it again. And that, that email will never, from that address will never come into your inbox. So actually, that's not a challenge really, because anybody who's in email marketing, we should be getting consent and clear opt-ins anyway. That's GDPR compliant. That's just good practice against spam and all those. So that's fine. Um, and I think it's also what it does, it means it makes the welcome email much, much more important. So to get past that screener, you need to um, send your email from a recognizable email address and clearly explain why this email is being sent. Um, and also, in order to get around this tracking, or not get around it, but to kind of meet that, um, that, that demand, um, you can offer personalization. So for example, you know, when, when somebody signs up to your email list, then that's the opportunity to kind of start segmenting your email list and offering people the ability to, they're interested in one particular area. For example, if you're a hotel, you know, you might find that, um, uh, you, you know, if you get your, get your people to sign up through the restaurant, they're more likely to be local and they're more likely to be repeat visitors. So you can personalize your email slightly differently that way. And you said, well, if they stayed in the hotel, they're more likely to be visitors and be more interested in travel and what's going on around the neighborhood. So you can kind of offer us to segment um, people's preferences there. And also, if, if reporting isn't allowed, you know, if you've disabled your individual trackings, for example, on MailChimp, we have a lot of people on Hey or in the future on Mac Mail that can't track individual behavior. Well, there are other ways to work out whether an email campaign's worked. One, you can monitor website traffic a few hours after the campaign. If there's a spike, it's a pretty good chance it's going to be due to your email. And you can also, within your email, create trackable links. These are otherwise known as UTM links, which you can create through Google, actually, <laughs> and other things. But um, what these will do is um, 
uh, you can insert them into your buttons on your email marketing campaign and they're not individually identifiable. All they'll do is count the number of times somebody clicked on that link and what it will do is tell you what it came from that particular email. So that's another good way and you're not invading people's privacy because they're not saying Andrew Evelyn clicked on it, they're just saying one person clicked on it. So in other words, so if you, you know, if uh, with email marketing, you can get around, you can still run very, very successful campaigns without the need to know who opened and when they opened. Search, Google search. Well, we all know 40, uh, uh, how dominant Google search is. Something like 98% in the UK of searches online are done through Google. And what's happening is Google are now dominating more and more of their search page. And in some instances, 40% of it is Google search. And of course, every time you use Google, you're being tracked. So what are the alternatives? There are a couple that I use. Ecosia is a great alternative search engine. Uh, and the nice thing about that, every time you click, I think every time you click 45 times, a tree is planted. Marvellous. And another alternative is DuckDuckGo. And they're, they're, they're a full scale web browser as well. And they are really, really hot on privacy. So both of those, if you, if you want to, um, from a personal perspective, if you want alternatives to Google, Ecosia or DuckDuckGo are good alternatives. Right, website analytics, this is a biggie. So in iOS 14, it hasn't been launched yet. So the latest Apple iPhone and iPad software update, Apple were going to introduce something in Safari that would block third party tracking cookies. So I talked about cookies earlier, and this is big. What this basically means is that Safari, which uh, has, uh, is the second biggest web browser after Chrome, you will actually have to say, I do want to be tracked. And I suspect most people will say no. So this is going to, actually, this is what DuckDuckGo does and Brave, those earlier browsers I mentioned, they stop, they block third party tracking cookies. And what you'll see here is Google Analytics, the second one from the bottom. So what that actually means is that when uh, they've delayed the launch of this speech, we think until spring. But what this means is that your website analytics, if you rely on Google Analytics, potentially 20, 30 to 30% of your visits aren't going to be tracked. So how, um, you know, you're not going to get a full picture of what's happening with website behavior. So how are you going to get around that? So to my mind, this combined with um, Google Analytics invasion on your privacy, we need to find an alternative. And the alternative for me is Fathom Analytics. So this is, um, this is version two, they're about to launch version three. This was launched by Paul Jarvis, who I mentioned earlier. And this um, is what I have on my website. And it basically means I don't need a cookie banner. And they, Fathom Analytics don't track any individual IP addresses. They uh, have done some very, very clever software bits whereby they just track total numbers of visits. Now, Fathom Analytics doesn't have as much data as Google Analytics. And Google, if your business relies on reams and reams of data and you really, really dig, dig down deep into Google Analytics, then Fathom isn't the answer. But if, like most of my clients, who only really want the, who only really want the headline data and only really use it because they're, so, they're busy enough getting on with their business, they, they don't need all that data, then Fathom is a great alternative. Um, and if you click on that QR code, you'll go off to a web page and you'll get a $10 credit. And to be completely open with you, I can really kick back as well. And Fathom is a great alternative to Google Analytics. And that in large part is what's enabled me to dis uh, allowed me to disable uh, my cookie banner on my computer. Social media. It's a tricky one, social media, isn't it? Because um, a lot of businesses, and especially during this, these COVID times when networking isn't there, how do you get out in front of people? And social media is one of the ways. What I would say though is, is it really that visible to your customers? Your email, from my, this is that slide is from my Monday talk on email marketing. 99% of your emails will arrive in somebody's inbox, but because social media is so algorithmic, algorithmically controlled, only 6% of your Facebook posts will appear in your people's timelines. So, you know, there are some people, you know, the people behind Hay, who also do Basecamp, they, they have a Facebook media, uh, sorry, a Facebook free business approach. They don't appear on Facebook, they use WhatsApp, they use Instagram. And that's very commendable. 
uh, actions taken is something that I'm considering as removing my Facebook business page. To be honest, it doesn't really do a great deal, so why have I got it? I, I think, to be honest, I would struggle a little bit from a personal perspective because it's one of the ways that I still keep in touch with um, people from the past. Uh, so um, it's still fairly important to me. But from a business perspective, I suppose how we have to approach social media is in a sustainable way. And if we're not advertising, then we're not, you know, we're not plugging in. We're not, we're not invading people's privacy as much. Um, and so what I would say is let's, let's try and practice a policy of sustainable social media, which doesn't rely on advertising, but we use it um, rather than being concentrating on the number of likes we've got, the number of followers we've got, we think about a minimum viable audience. And this is a Seth Godin, the Oracle of Marketing uh, term is we don't necessarily, as a, as a business to business, as a web design business such as myself, I don't need thousands and thousands of followers. I actually probably only need 100 loyal people signed up to my email newsletter or follow me on social media. Because what they will do is if they are kind of keen on what I do, they will spread the message. And word of mouth is by far, far the best way. And I would say for most independent retailers, it's a similar thing. Independent retailers rely on word of mouth just as much. They rely on people saying that was a great product, it was a really, really friendly service. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to advertise. I think social media is a really good way for steering traffic into your email marketing or your website. It's also a great way of keeping in touch, building a community and sharing your work. And if you're just doing those things and being organic about it, then to me, that's quite sustainable. And it's not particularly invading your customers' personal privacy. Although, of course, it's not wholly true because Facebook is still gathering that data to use to advertise. But if you really, really must use social media because it's integral to your business, if you approach it in that way, then I think you're kind of contributing. And just to go back to that caveat, you know, it's not, this isn't about, boy, you know, it's not necessarily about an ambition to put these businesses out of business. It's not that. What it's trying to do is put a black hole in their data. This is what Fathom Analytics say. You know, we're never going to beat Google Analytics, but if we put enough black holes in their data so they can't track you, if Safari from Apple is doing enough to block tracking, and if more businesses do that, then Google Analytics and Google and Facebook have to change their behavior. And that's what we really want out of this. It's not to get rid of them. It's to encourage them to change their behavior so they do start respecting your privacy and not encouraging outrage and not encouraging addiction. Maps is another one. So Google Maps um, is used to basically do all sorts of tracking, as is Facebook check-in and all those. There are alternatives. The one I use because I'm an Apple fanboy is Apple Maps, which is a great alternative. Apple Maps doesn't track individual. Um, it doesn't know that Andrew Evelyn is currently in Cornwall or wherever they are. It doesn't know where I'm going. They don't track that at an individual level. OpenStreetMaps and OSM and are two other alternatives on that as well. Messaging, this is a bit more tricky, but if you really, really want to go the whole hog and boycott WhatsApp, then good luck with you on that because I think I'll find it very hard. But, you know, if we're gonna go the whole hog and really send a message to um, Facebook, we'd boycott WhatsApp as well. Uh, these are three alternatives, good old text, of course, but there's also two others, Signal, although I think there's a little bit of um, question marks over who's behind Signal and Telegram, which is open source and they do very similar things to WhatsApp. Telegram in particular is one I um, would keep your eye on in terms of being very privacy focused, um, but also enabling group chats and video chats as well. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm, um, uh, my final piece is why is inspecting your, uh, respecting your customer's privacy good for business? Well, I think it's all part of this be sustainable, go organic. I know it sounds a bit, you know, how does that work? Well, if you're not advertising, and remember, go back, if you don't advertise online, then you're not invading your, your, your customer's privacy. So if you can rely on purely organic means, then you're halfway there. And I think, you know, this is kind of allied to going green. It's, it's kind of allied with, with all that sustainability, with climate change and consumption and things like that. I think we can do a similar thing online with being um, focused on privacy. 
you know, do you need all this data? There's so much data with Google Analytics, Facebook Insights, and all those kind of things. But I would say the question, how much do you need to do it? How much do you spend? If you're spending lots and lots of time in data, trying to second guess what your customer's doing, then that might not be the best use of your time. You might well be better ignoring that and actually using your instinct. And as, um, uh, you know, and freeing yourself from the algorithms. You, know, you don't need that. But as Duke Stamp said, and this guy is behind, um, he's just about to launch a course actually through um, the Duke Book Company, uh, which looks really interesting. I'm thinking of, uh, I might do it. But Duke Stamp, who's behind some Nike advertising, all sorts of things, um, says we've capped imagination and with that possibility. We're intoxicated with algorithms, predictive outcomes, and an insatiable desire to preempt every creative thought with how do you measure it? And really, what's the alternative? Well, I think we're pretty intelligent humans and our instincts. And if we know our customer and we use our intuition, we don't need all this data. We don't need all these algorithms. You know, most of you, I'm guessing, are small businesses. You know your customers personally. So do you really need all these reams of data or can you use alternative methods like Fathom Analytics and save money and not use um, Google Ads, which may or may not work for your Facebook ads, but actually use your instincts? If you know your customer, I say I know my customer pretty well, I'm guessing a lot of you do. And this, this story comes from somebody I met at a barbecue on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, it was the day of what would have been the fruit market but of course it wasn't because of COVID and they're not doing them anymore, they were doing virtually. But she was saying, I was talking to her about privacy and about Fathom Analytics and, uh, and the stuff I've been talking to you today about. And she went on to say, yeah, free market's really good. Whenever we go, we always get an upsurge in website visits, in Facebook follows, Instagram likes, email marketing signups. And to me, you know, I wrote a blog post about this actually as the best SEO. And they were, they were talking about whether they should have an SEO company. And I said to them, the best marketing you can do is be at the free market. No amount of SEO, no amount of Facebook posts or search engine optimization will replicate the success you can have by actually being out there in somewhere like a market. You know, that is the alternative. You know, you can get in front of your customers, you can talk to your customers, you can get to know your customers, and that will outweigh anything you do online. And that will in turn feed people back to your website to do whatever you want them to do. Another way, um, you know, rather than relying on data and relying on invading people's privacy, you know, share your knowledge. You know, do what I'm doing here and what I did on Monday with email marketing. Share, you know, you we're all, you know, curious human beings, you know. If you're learning about stuff and always being curious and always being interested, there's lots of stuff you can share. And by sharing that, that in itself will get you out there and avoid the need. I, I don't use Google Ads. Um, I, I have used them in the past because I've got an 80 quid credit and I have helped clients use Google Ads, but I'm getting increasingly skeptical about them. And from a personal perspective, most of my business comes from uh, a bit of Twitter, which I don't pay for, uh, and I think it's um, slightly better than other social media because at least they take an active role in um, taking down controversial posts. And it's great for conversations, great for learning stuff I can on Twitter. Um, if you want to follow me, by the way, I'm on at Evelyn. Um, but, uh, you know, that, and that, this is one of the ways that I get business. It's word of mouth. It's being out there to be part of the community, uh, which comes up next, contributing to your community. Um, you know, you don't need to advertise all the time. You can be an active part of that. Uh, and also networking, a bit more difficult at the moment with COVID. Uh, and I certainly miss getting out and meeting local businesses. But there are lots of alternative ways of marketing, some of which I've just mentioned, and some of which respect, they all respect your customers' privacy, in fact, because they're all opting in. So overall, I would just say respect your users' time. Technology should be used to serve your customers and not advertising. And this is kind of, a, I suppose, it's just a, a slightly different way of approaching it, not to rely on that online advertising, which is set up to invade your customers' privacy, but to think of alternative ways. And to me, more organic and more sustainable and more long-term ways of getting new or, or appealing to your customers and getting in front of them. Um, just as a little plug before I finish, and thank you very much for listening. I did a, um, uh, a talk on Monday 
uh, about building a community and not an email list. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a bit of a, a, an issue with um, the, the voice and the presentation. So if you click on that um, uh, or follow that QR code, uh, that will take you somewhere. If you send, uh, sign up to your email, there are 12 free tips over 12 weeks on email marketing. And uh, it's all about, you know, in a way, it's a, it's a bit about, it kind of works alongside this. It's about not invading people's privacy. It's about creating a community around an email list. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And just as a final thing, thanks to our supporters and partners, which you can see here. Uh, sorry, I have overrun a little bit. Um, but thank you very much for listening. Are there any uh, questions? I'm just going to come out of there. And there are some questions, if um, which I'm just uh, having a look at. And I'm going to just open up, switch to gallery view. So, uh, so some and on us thinking about the benefits for small businesses and organisations to reach out to targeted groups much more affordable to any of those who advertise to those who are likely to be interested. So that's uh, that was put up at half ten. Yeah, Ruth Hennell, thank you very much. Saying, um, yeah, interesting. See if uh, the only reason she's tracking individual behaviour is because of Mailchimp uh, to see if there's any errors and things like that. And she's quite uh, hopeful that without tracking it, you can still run your business. And also Ruth talking about uh, digital skills and no computer. People tend to be more dependent on social media. They're like, less likely to use search and websites. Um, can use ethical quandaries for organizations working with them to help those groups. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one because um, you can't deny that social media and Google and all these things have done great things for us. And I don't think we're ever gonna reach a perfect world, but, um, uh, if we can, then uh, we can certainly change our behavior. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Ruth, sorry, long compass. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> they are, because I'm doing it live. But um, uh, yeah, if you, uh, I don't know if, if, you, if anybody's got any questions that they want to do live over, uh, they can do. Um, if you want to put anything in the comments, or I know I've overrun this five past one, so maybe we uh, need to close. But um, Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Bath Digital Festival. I'm gonna um, close this down now and uh, hope you're all gonna go and enjoy some lunch now because that's what I'm gonna do. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>